Human progressions are the ones with like the. You're looking down this like a bond between two of them. Oh yeah, with the circles. Yep. Oh, okay, yeah, I just want to make sure. So chair confirmations will help with that a little bit if you got good at them. So um, usually uh, when we think about our periodic table, right? Um, when we think about our compounds, one thing that you really get introduced to in organic uh, are ring structures. So compounds that like make a, a link. And so the idea is, is that uh, they can be stable, but a lot of times rings are not. They're very unenergetically favorable. One thing is torsional strain. Um, and torsional strain is basically where your electrons in eclipse bonds are really close to each other. So I'll turn on my camera. Can you guys see me? So like, oh, I take off my dot cam. So basically when you have orbitals, like if this is an orbital that's filled and this is another one, they want to be far away from each other because if they're close together like this, you have this um, interaction that's not favorable, right? Remember electrons want to be as far apart. And so torsional strain, this is what happens when they are on top of each other like that. If you like turn them ever so slightly sideways, it's better. And if they form a 180, that's even the best way to do it. So when we think about these bonded ring structures, we have to worry about that. So ring strain um, can be caused by, ring strain can be caused by torsional angle and steric. So if you remember back to Gen Kim, when we were talking about this type of stuff, um, Angle strain, uh, there's the 109.5 degrees is the best for an sp3 carbon. And if you make that angle any smaller between the bonds, you get this angle strain. And so if you had a flat ring, this is what the angles would be. So which, if you look at it, which ring would be the best one for our bond angle? It, it would be oh. a, the pentagon, right? But this is only thinking of it in a second, in a 2D dimension. This isn't bringing into account the 3D dimension. And so as we see them here, they kind of like rotate themselves from what you would expect. And so what we find is that six membered rings actually are our most stable. So this is a very important question because a lot of professors like to ask this. The heat of combustion versus heat of combustion per TH2. So if you look at heat of combustion, it goes up no matter how many, like the, it's how much combustion energy it takes to burn the entire ring. That always increases from a three-membered ring to four to five, six, seven, right? It's always increasing. If we look at heat of combustion per CH2, the biggest is our three-membered, four-membered, five member, then six, and then it slowly goes back up until we get to 12, All right? So if I was to say I have a ring, I have rings that are from three carbons to 12 carbons, which one has the greatest heat of combustion? You would tell me the 12 ring because it's the largest ring, right? The largest one is always gonna have the biggest heat of combustion. Now, if I said I have a three membered ring all the way through a 12 membered ring, and I said, which one has the biggest heat of combustion per CH2, you would tell me it's the three membered ring. Make sure you know that distinction, right? If you're talking about per CH2, it's the three-membered. If it's total, it's just the biggest ring possible. All right. So when you make cyclobutane, you can kind of see here how like it's not flat, right? It's like kind of puckered like that. Like the sides are, are picking up a little bit. So it's not a flat three-membered ring. And your angle strain is 88 degrees. You're about 20 angle, you're about 20 degrees off of an ideal angle. So this is why one of the things that become possible. And if you look at those orbitals here from the carbon, this is bad. You don't want orbitals to overlap like that, that aren't bonding. When you have that happen, it's, it just is not ideal. And so this is why this isn't a great ring structure. It's, it's just, it, there's too much, there's too many things going on. Um, if you look at cyclopentane, this is slightly um, a little bit better, but now you have something called the slight torsional strain. And basically it makes something called an envelope conformation. So if you think of an envelope, like the front, like lifts up, like you're folding it back like that. This is basically 
uh, a very good compromise. So five membered rings are fairly stable, but our six membered ring is going to be the most stable. So four is going to be our most stable. So four is the most stable, then three, and then it kind of gets dicey. So, right. And so then when you think about this, remember how we said we, our rings don't exist like in a straight flat planar? they kind of turn themselves in the bonds like this so that you, if you look here at like my six member ring, they turn themselves so that there's less overlap. They can get to the 109.5 degrees. They avoid any overlap and these are really good. Chair conformation, chair flips. You go from chair to half chair to twist boat to boat to twist boat to half chair to chair. And so when you do this, this is actually what happens when you do a ring flip it takes a lot of energy to go through these. So that's why when you get into a happy conformation, it can flip to the other one, but it just depends. All right. And so cyclohexane has no ring strain and chair conformation. Um, there's no angle strain. There's no torsional strain. This is your best way to get it. So this is the uh, six membered C6H12. Uh, the six membered ring is fantastic, All right? So now, if you're ever asked on a test question, which of these conformations is the least stable? If it's a chair conformation versus anything else, like a half boat or boat, like this, these are boats, the boats are always more unstable than chairs. So if, you, if you're immediately saying, I have chairs and boats, look at the uh, boat conformations first, then try to decide. So chair, chair, I'm gonna ignore boat, boat. So now, once you have everything, you look at anything that's connected to it. So when you have groups that are coming off, like, you know, substituents, you want them to be pointing away from each other. So which one of this is going to be our least stable? One or three? One, because they're pointing at each other, right? So anytime you have any type of substituent like that that's pointing towards each other, um, this is always going to be an issue. And you just kind of have to pay attention to it and make sure that that's not really an issue. But if you get a question like this on the exam and it's like, which one's the most unstable, ignore the chairs, look at the boat. Oh, sorry. Yeah, ignore the chairs, look at the boats. If it's which one is the most stable, ignore the boats, look at the chairs, all right? So drawing a chair confirmation, these are just some things on how to draw it. Um, if you look correctly, it's it's three sets of parallel lines that you're drawing your chair conformation. And then each carbon on a chair has two substituents, an axial and an equatorial, all right? It doesn't matter what you draw or whatnot, they will always have two. Um, and so axials, they alternate. So one up, the next carbon over will be down, the next one over will be up, the next one will be down. And then your equatorials are the same thing. They're either slightly pointing up or slightly pointing down and they just alternate like that, okay? So if you ever draw a chair conformation and you have like up and the next carbon over is up, you've drawn it wrong. They should alternate like that, all right? And so then there is our wonderful little thing. If you are having trouble visualizing rings, it is good to have like a picture like this here at the bottom right, save somewhere so that you can go back to it if need be. If you have a molecular kit and you really need help with it during tests and you can use them, have one built. Carry it in your bag so that you can use it during the exam. Most professors will let you. I would ask your professor if you can use one or not. I don't know if she would, but a lot of professors are pretty okay with you using one during the exam if you use a molecular kit. So um, what the one rule that you always have to remember, and I'll ask Gwen or Mag, because you guys will remember, what's the one rule that I told you guys when you're drawing from a 2D ring to a chair conformation. What do you have to be? Consistent. Consistent. It doesn't matter any, and nothing else matters just as long as you're consistent. So I have a methyl on the first, second, and third carbon, right? Just gonna number it one, two, three. So one, two, three, four. A is wrong, that spacing's wrong between them. One, two, three. All right, that spacing seems right. One, two, three, spacing seems right. And then uh, one, two, three, four. So it's between B and C now, right? So when they are wedges, are those pointing out of the page or into the page? They're pointing up. They're pointing so, out of the page, which means that they are pointing up. So both of your methyl groups have to be pointing up. So if you look here, B, 
up, up. C, it's axial up, but this one is equatorial down, right? So it can't be C. If this was, if this was drawn here, it would be a dash. Does that make sense? Okay. Like I said, just be consistent. Now, ring flips are, they just take practice. But the important thing to remember is if it is pointing up before the ring flip, it'll be pointing up after the ring flip. Directionality does not change. It is always pointing up or pointing down. But if I'm going up axial after the ring flip, I'll be going up equatorial. So I'll be going between axial equatorial between every ring flip, but I will always still be pointing the same direction. Same thing if it was pointing down, it would still be axial down or equatorial down, right? So directionality doesn't change just between axial and equatorial. So this is our Newman projections, right? This is what they look like. So this is what a Newman projection looks like for your um, rings for your cyclohexane. And if you notice, this is what we're talking about where um, the um, your axial down here and then here they're equatorial, right? So they're still pointing downwards away from the bonding center. They're just alternating between that. And so if you notice all that's happening is that this carbon right here, this bond is being dragged up. So you can see now it's pointing up and this carbon in the back is being dragged down. And now you can see it being down here in the back. Does that make sense? So you're just taking your two outer carbons and going, and as you do that, that causes the rest of the carbons to reorient, uh, reorient. So this is just a, you are changing the directionality of the carbons. So if you look here at this top one, carbon pointing down, carbon pointing up, carbon pointing up, carbon pointing down. So you're just imagining you're taking those carbons like that um, and, and that's it, so. All right. So let's go ahead and continue on. So now, which represents the ring flip of this structure? which represents the ring flip of this one. Is it E? It's our answer E. So let's take a look. So we are, we are, equi we are axial up. So when you do a ring flip, which directionality should this be going now? Still up or does it go down? It still should be going up, but it's axial, so it's going to become equatorial, right? This is ME is equatorial, so it should become axial. And E is going to be our correct answer, right? If you look at B, B has the, B is, is incorrect. This, these all flip they're, they're the way that they're structured. So um, our answer is going to be E, so. Make sense? Yeah, do you always just like move to the left? That's like kind of like my biggest issue. Like how do you know like where they move? Like it makes sense in that one. Oh, uh, so one second real quick. Let me just, I need to, I'm gonna pause the recording real quick.